Okay, we're going to start up the, uh, the second half of our uh, all-star lineup this afternoon. And um, to, uh, to, to manage the second half of our program, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our moderator, who is uh, Ray Ramsey. By way of introduction, Ray is, uh, is known to many of you, is the president and CEO of TechNet. Uh, as many of you know, TechNet is a, a, a preeminent political network of CEOs and uh, senior executives leading U.S. Uh, technology companies. I, I've always been struck by the, the breadth of TechNet's uh, membership, which includes uh, uh, e-commerce companies, clean tech, biotech, venture capital, told uh, from your website that it uh, represents two, <laughs> membership representing <laughs> two million, I don't know what kind of source that is, two million employees and $800 billion in revenues represented by TechNet's membership. Uh, and Ray also has uh, experience in the nonprofit sector, uh, he was previously CEO of One Economy, a uh, wonderful uh, and leading nonprofit that uses technology uh, to connect low-income people to the to the economic mainstream. Uh, One Economy, uh, which Ray really helped build uh, from a very small operation to a very large one, has now helped uh, bring broadband access into the homes of, of over 300,000 people uh, since 2000. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming our next panel. Will be introduced by our moderator, Ray Ramsey. Great, thank you, Alan. It's good to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm seated between two uh, highly charged, powerful minds, and so my job is to not get in their way as we talk a little bit about innovation and the economy and, and about jobs. So without my reading glasses, I'm going to attempt to uh, say a few things, <laughs> and Robin's offering me hints about them, but uh, uh, seated to my right is uh, uh, Marvin uh, Amori, and uh, Marvin is, is an attorney, and uh, I know that's rare in Washington. And uh, he's very active in a, in a wonderful, relatively new uh, nonprofit organization called Engine Advocacy. Um, but he's got a long distinguished career. He's worked at, he was the uh, head lawyer at Free Press, um, a highly regarded organization here in town. Um, he's been listed in Fast Company, but he's noted as an expert in international law and public policy. Uh, that combines uh, legal analysis and political strategy. So many years of experience and is well qualified to talk on the topics that we have today. Uh, the gentleman seated to my left, who is a powerhouse of information and knowledge um, in terms of the innovation sector, who I've known for many years. Um, Rob is the founder of a, a highly regarded organization, the ITI Foundation, um, that he started and um, brought uh, to bear. He was also the vice president of the Progressive Policy Institute and has, like with our previous panel, he has a book um, that's out and available um, for, for those who might be interested, uh, Innovation Economics. It's not his first book, he's got other books, um, but uh, is someone that our industry uh, turns to a lot um, for thought leadership on a wide range of issues. So what I want to do is just dive into questions and, um, and let these gentlemen talk a little bit. But as they speak, I think they've each prepared uh, a few minutes of remarks. I want them to, uh, in their remarks, point out a policy area that we can focus on as a nation that will really help rev up our economy. So in your remarks, uh, gentlemen, if you could sort of think about a very specific policy uh, prescription uh, for, the for the country that would uh, move the economy further. So um, I think I'll start uh, with Rob on my left. All right, well, thank you, uh, Ray, for that kind introduction. I appreciate that. And um, so I want to make a pitch for a really great book, even better than mine, and that's Blair's book. Uh, you just have to read that book, so. Uh, I, I concur with <coughs> that, actually. It is a good and book. And it's short. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also want to make a plug, uh, for those of you who can't get enough of this, uh, tomorrow is the very first Data Innovation Day that my colleague Daniel Castro in the back, Daniel, raise your hand, has been leading for us. So we're doing uh, two big events, one at our shop at 9 o'clock and one on the Hill at <coughs> noon on uh, the importance of data innovation, first one on the federal government, second one on, uh, in the private sector. So um, I think maybe before I answer this question, what should we do? I think I just want a couple of quick things on why the Internet's so important uh, to the U.S. economy. Uh, there's a lot of different studies on that, some of which we've done, others like McKinsey Global Institute have done, uh, that, you know, make a very compelling case. There's a report out there that we have on dot-com at 25 where we, uh, uh, we assessed and measured that this, the dot-com portion of the Internet itself makes the, uh, makes the global economy output $1.5 trillion larger every year. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of uh, 
that's a lot of uh, value added and income for people. Uh, McKinsey Global Institute just did a study. The internet contribution uh, in the globe is larger than the GDP of Canada. 30% uh, of all global internet revenues accrue to the U.S. Much, so we, we punch much above our weight. It's a critical uh, industry to the U.S. And we estimate that in uh, 20, by 2020, the global internet economy is going to be worth $3.8 trillion. Uh, it's more than that, though. The internet is a key driver of productivity. Now, despite what we're hearing, the AP is doing a little series today. We saw, if you saw 60 Minutes last week, to me, one of the most troubling things we have to worry about is this growing, what I would call, Luddite uh, uh, orientation and mindset that seems to be taking over Washington, that somehow machines are bad, and the Internet is a machine, and it enables machines. And somehow, if we just stop these machines from taking over, that we'll all get back to 4% unemployment. Uh, this is, frankly, just utter nonsense. I hate to be so blunt, but it really is utter nonsense, and it's a very dangerous meme because it suggests that if we're losing our jobs to the Internet, that we shouldn't support Internet policy, and nothing could be farther than the truth. The very, very clear evidence that high productivity does not lead to fewer jobs. In fact, most of the evidence suggests that the higher the productivity, the more jobs you have, not the fewer. Clearly. Internet leads to higher productivity. The number of different studies, by one by our colleague Lauren Hitt at Penn, that show that IT workers contribute much more to productivity. That IT itself, uh, when companies invest in internet technology, it has three times the productivity impact than uh, than uh, other non-capital. And just in terms of jobs, we did a study recently. We looked at the growth of IT occupations. So people who are using IT. Uh, you know, whether they're web developers or system engineers or whatever, or programmers, uh, those jobs are up 22% uh, in the last decade, while overall U.S. jobs are up 0%. <laughs> so it's really a, you know, solar, so almost sole source of growth in our economy. Uh, just in the last five years, uh, jobs declined, or 2007, 2011, jobs declined 4.5%, yet Internet jobs were up 7%. Uh, and another M MGI, McKinsey Global Institute, for every one, one job destroyed by the Internet, where companies are using that to make uh, things more efficient, 2.6 jobs were created elsewhere. So that really, to me, gets to this question of what should we do. Uh, the Internet and IT in general are key drivers to innovation, to GDP growth, to productivity and jobs. Um, so clearly we need uh, to do more of it. Um, and let me start by saying, uh, you know, I, I think that there's sort of this unfortunate tendency in Washington to have these, these sort of monolithic camps that, 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 that are really have, have a view of the world that, that doesn't allow anything else to penetrate them. Um, and, and I see the world really between three big camps in Washington. There's the abdicate camp, there's the regulate camp, and there's the camp that I'm in and I think everybody should be in, which is the facilitate camp. And the abdicate camp, we heard a little bit about from Grover Norquist. <laughs> Uh, it's largely just don't do anything, you know, just get out of the way. This is a magic thing. The, the, the spirit and miracle of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs will do all this. Um, despite the fact that the spirit and miracle of Silicon Valley is built on federal technology, the Internet itself, I was at one salon dinner once, I'll always remember it, where one uh, conservative think tank advocate said, uh, we don't need the government, I mean, just look at the Internet. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess they for forgot about GPS, GPS and, uh, you know, many, many technologies. Uh, the regulate position is, is to me, uh, also quite prevalent, and it's saying this is a dangerous set of technologies. Uh, it tends to monopoly, towards monopoly. Uh, we should be regulating it. Uh, we see this increasingly, I think, not just here, but in Europe. Uh, we need to be regulating privacy and the use of data quite stringently, even though, we sh as we're showing tomorrow and others, Data innovation is a critical part of our economy. Uh, we see that also with regard to telecom policy, uh, where this notion that um, uh, we need to continue to use legacy regulations in telecom. So what does a facilitate, um, uh, what does a facilitate regime look like? I, I think it looks like uh, six uh, big points. Before I do that, let me just qu quickly add one other thing, though. You know, there's this meme in Washington now all about Internet freedom, that, that somehow if you say you're not for Internet freedom, you're, you're somewhere between a child molester and a communist. <laughs> and I have to say, I, I think the Internet freedom thing is really a very misleading, it, it doesn't get you where you want to go, because it's not about freedom. I mean, we don't have, we have free speech in the United States, but we don't have freedom. We don't, as uh, 
Justice Brandeis, I think, once said, I think it was him, you don't have the freedom to yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Holmes. Pardon? Holmes. Justice, oh, Justice Holmes. Yeah, Holmes. And, and we don't have the freedom, uh, I don't have the freedom to go take this lady's uh, uh, Apple uh, computer either. And yet somehow we have this notion that the internet is different and we have the freedom uh, to steal intellectual content, we have the freedom uh, to engage in cybercrime and the like, and, and we clearly don't. Uh, another area I think where we have that mistake is around taxes. So I have a proposal to drive internet adoption and, and internet uh, use in the economy, and that's to raise corporate taxes on all companies that don't have websites. Um, this would clearly drive companies to develop websites. Now, I'm obviously being tongue-in-cheek, but that's essentially what the internet sales tax regime is about. We're charging having companies that don't do this. They have to pay, consumers have to pay sales tax, and ones who do on the internet don't. So, what do we need to do? Uh, very quickly, six things. Number one, I think we need to really drive the internet economy to its, uh, to, to its promise. And I think, by the way, the promise is everything that could be digital should be digital. That's the vision, I think, we have everything that should, can be. So, I don't know why I'm using this piece of paper. I mean, I, geez, I should have brought my iPad with me, but everything that can be digital should be digital. Every single process, everything we'll sing in our economy. So now how do we get there? Number one, we have to do a better job of encouraging universal digital use. That includes the fact that everybody should be able to use uh, and, and have computers and broadband. Number two, uh, we need to transform uh, governments into internet governments. And we've made some progress there, but frankly, we have a long, long way to go there. And that's a big, low-hanging fruit uh, for local, state, county, federal to really drive that. Um, third, we need to support platforms. And I think, again, this is where I think my, uh, my uh, conservative colleagues sometimes might miss it, although uh, I have to say Bruce Melman is, is great on this. There are a lot of platforms that, that developers and other people build on. Uh, clearly, next generation broadband, high-speed broadband, Spectrum as a platform, uh, health IT as a platform, uh, digital signatures. Uh, my, again, my colleague Daniel Castro did groundbreaking work on looking at where we are as a country on digital signatures. We are woefully behind other countries on digital signature technology. And digital signature technology is a platform technology with chicken or egg characteristics. We're slow to get there if we don't have a policy towards it. Fourth, we need to support internet innovation itself. That includes things like a much better research and development tax credit, much better work on high-skill immigration, as well as domestic STEM policy, and frankly, much more federal support for ICT R&D. There's a recent report by the OS OSTP, the PCAST that came out, a group called NIDERT, National, I forget what NIDERT stands for, but it's a National Information yeah. Technology and Research and Development, I think it is. And it was very, very clear the key role government R&D has played in the internet and IT and the fact that there's a lot more challenges that need to be supported. Five, we need to fight digital protectionism. I, I see this not just in the wicked context, but we see it internationally with cloud computing restrictions. We also see it nationally where uh, many, many industries don't like the internet and they want protection from it. In the most recent case, I had a lot of fun. I was on a pet meds panel at, at the FTC where veterinarians do not want to give you your prescription uh, for your pet medication so that you can get it on the internet because it would take money away from them. And so they're arguing that if you get your prescription on pet meds that, uh, that, that little uh, Muffy the dog or Spot the dog will die. And we've seen this in many, many other industries, co contact lenses, but we still do it. You can't buy your car on the internet in the U.S. You can in Brazil. Uh, we have medical restrictions. You can't do cross-state medical consulting. Uh, there are lots and lots of industries that law, law, law provision is another one. And lastly, I think we need to do a much better job of fighting internet crime. Um, internet crime is growing. We see it in terms of uh, global uh, spam, malware, and piracy. And frankly, if we have an internet where the rule of law doesn't apply, it's not going to be a very robust platform for growth. So I do think if we took all six of those quite seriously, uh, that we would continue and have even more robust growth in the internet economy. Thank you, Rob. Marvin. Sure. <clears throat> so I'll follow the same format of saying a few words as to why uh, the tech sector is so important, and then talk about some of the research that InGen Advocacy has done and some proposals. Uh, so a brief word about InGen Advocacy. They're, they're an organization that organizes startups and gives them a voice in DC. Uh, it includes 400 startups. It's based in San Francisco. One of the members is Uber, and their, their CEO spoke yesterday. But they're members all across the country. And one of the interesting things that the folks who are organizing 
that organization have found is just the prevalence of startups all over the country. Uh, and they, they recently released a report called Technology Works, which really emphasizes this point. Uh, and a lot of the, the data that, that Rob has, has highlighted uh, is highlighted in that report as well. And so the first uh, interesting point is that we should think of, of the internet and the tech sector in general as a vertical, as sort of a, a whole set of industries that are their own industry vertical, where there's a lot of growth and there's a lot of hiring even for non-STEM employees. We should also think of it as a sort of horizontal underlying every other industry in the country. Uh, and so that's, so when we see growth in the vertical, we also see growth in lots of different industries based on technological innovations. You know, so every company has a systems administrator. But we also see in, say, the um, taxi cab industry, lots of innovation, lots of disruption. Right? We saw that with Uber in the discussion yesterday. We see that with Uber Taxi. We see that with um, Sidecar and Lyft, these new services that let you pick up a ride from anyone in a peer-to-peer -peer way. And so the, the effect of innovation from uh, the internet is across the entire industry and across the entire country. So the, um, the reasons why innovation are so important is one, jobs, right? Jobs is the number one thing people talk about in DC because of the high unemployment rate. Two, increase in GDP and sort of economic growth. Uh, there's been a sort of revolution in economic theory in the past few decades uh, showing that the most uh, real growth uh, in standard of living and in an economy comes from innovation, comes from new technology. Uh, and the third reason, which actually goes to something that Grover was discussing, is deficit reduction. You know, if you ever listen to Senator Dre Moran of Kansas speak, he tells you he got interested in tech issues because he wanted to help reduce the deficit. But if we're not going to increase taxes or cut spending uh, for political reasons, then we have to increase the pie in order to cut the deficit. So innovation is actually core to a lot of the challenges that we face, and, uh, and, and we can see the benefit of tech innovation uh, across the country and across different industries. Um, and so the, um, the, the, the research that InGen did on the question of tech innovation and what's happening in terms of jobs especially uh, has really two, you know, I think, very interesting conclusions. And this was a, a report commissioned by InGen and done by the Bay Area Economic Institute. So two key um, takeaways. One, at the moment, uh, tech jobs and tech uh, industries are clustered in different areas. They're clustered in Silicon Valley, uh, Boston, the Tech Corridor in DC, Austin, these kinds of places. But growth in these industries and growth in the jobs is all over the country in the South, in the Midwest. And so if you're a member of Congress or a staffer for a member of Congress, before you know it, your member of Congress will also be a member who should really care about technology. Right? We see you know, job growth in, uh, you know, in Cleveland around the medical infrastructure coming out of Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland, Insti uh, Cleveland Clinic and other medical centers there. We see growth in aerospace in Alabama through, through NASA. Uh, and almost anywhere we have a research institution, uh, you see a lot of growth uh, just coming out of that institution, coming out of licensing and invention. And so one, um, there's just a spread across the entire country. It'll no longer be just a few clusters. And two, when you add uh, high-tech jobs, right, each high-tech job actually increases the number of non-high-tech jobs in the community. Right? We've seen this as very robust. We've seen this from you know, the McKinsey study that Rob mentioned shows that every lost, one lost job to technology results in 2.1 in, uh, jobs that are added. And this was from the internet alone. The definition in the engine report is a little broader, but we find that the multiplier for every one tech job in a community adds 4.1 sort of non-tech jobs, or at least local jobs. These could be teachers, these could be hairdressers, these could be lawyers, like many of us, right? sort of the non-tradable sector sees a huge benefit. And that's partly because of the high earnings that a lot of these, that these uh, tech industry jobs have. You know, if the, you have that kind of money, you spend it, and you need you know, a lawyer on whom to spend that money, or, or restaurants, et cetera. And so what we see is that there's a huge benefit for jobs, uh, and it's spreading across the entire country. 
And so in terms of um, proposals, right? So I, uh, I agree with a lot of what Rob said, and I you know, vehemently disagree with a lot of what he said. I won't, I won't go into the details right now, but I totally agree that we need uh, platforms available for uh, high-tech innovation, uh, you know, everything from the way lawyers manage their documents to you know, the, the way you, you book a room on Airbnb uh, is, is dependent on the internet and technology. Uh, and so those platforms, you know, I think that if we don't have world-leading, high-speed, <coughs> ubiquitous networks, we will fall behind the rest of the world and we will stunt our economy. Uh, you know, in, in all of the sort of reports we see in, in OECD data, we're 22nd or something in the world in speed, price, penetration. And, you know, we can debate about how we get there. Right? You know, I, I think government intervention might be necessary in terms of net neutrality and sort of other ways to encourage gigabit connections. But I, but I think both of us agree that we would need to get there in order to keep our economy going, whether there's sort of public private partnerships or um, some, other, some other innovative solutions you know, such as Blair Levin's to get us to a point where platforms are ubiquitous and, and, and really uh, high capacity here as well as elsewhere. Uh, and then I think, you know, spending just a little time with startups really convinces me the importance of, you know, talent and just hiring the right people and having the right people available. Whenever I speak to a startup CEO and I say, oh, how do you spend your time? You know, I, I hope he says, you know, flying around the world being fabulous, but instead it's trying to hire people. You know, it's like hiring people all, you know, spend lots of time hiring people trying to s steal the very top talent away, uh, both at the, um, at the highest levels, you know, head of product, head of whatever, and at lower levels, just engineers uh, that are needed out of MIT and Princeton. And one of the issues there, uh, among others, uh, has to do with the, the, the immigration laws at the moment. And hopefully something this year will happen around high-tech immigration reform, as well as perhaps comprehensive reform but th this is a, an issue that lots of folks in, uh, in the high-tech sector think about. And if we can't have the most talented people starting companies here and working for companies here, they'll do that elsewhere. And we see just a you know, global, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quicker, we see a sort of global uh, competition where you know, Chile and Canada are really encouraging high-tech entrepreneurs to move uh, to those countries uh, and, uh, and, and we could fall behind. So those are sort of two proposals I gave you, platforms and, uh, and talent generally, which I think is both immigration and uh, STEM education and other, other things, sort of growing homegrown talent, which we shouldn't forget. Well, that, that last point is what I was going to have us pivot to, because we've heard about Spectrum and, and the platforms. I wanted to talk about the people part of this a little bit. And Rob, I wanted to turn to you um, and sort of give us um, some thoughts about what's coming down the pike in Congress and potentially some other ideas in this whole uh, human capital uh, area, which is vital um, for innovation and, and thriving for our sector. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Um, I, I just want to come back to the, uh, Marvin's point about H-1Bs. And, and uh, you know, I, I think our whole debate about H-1Bs is, is based on this fundamentally flawed uh, view um, there's, a, there's a notion in economics that economists use called the lump of labor fallacy, and the <coughs> idea is if it's sort of a job is eliminated, it's gone forever. And it really is a reflection of this sort of first order thinking, and, and the same thing with H-1Bs. There's a view that if you bring in a top-level scientist from India or China or Canada, that they're going to take a job away from an American. That would only be true if this top-level scientist doesn't spend a single penny. <coughs> they take all of their money and they bury it. But in reality, when a top-level scientist or engineer comes, they, they do exactly what Marvin talked about in those communities. They actually spend the money, and, and, and they create jobs because of it. So I, I think it's just we got to get over that and realize that we got, we're in competition for talent. What are the things that are going on? Well, you know, obviously the president talked about this in the State of the Union, which was, which was a good sign. Uh, you know, historically, the last few years, we've held high-skill immigration hostage for trying to get broader uh, immigration, comprehensive immigration reform. I don't know. I'm less pessimistic than I was a few years ago that perhaps the logjam is breaking and perhaps we could segment out high skill. Uh, obviously there's Moran, uh, there's a, you talked about Congressman Moran, but the, the, the Moran, Warner, Coons, Rubio, uh, Startup America 2.0 Act has been, I think it was just reintroduced, uh, it's or going, going to be, be, I think we Hatch. had one of Hatch. my guys was at a meeting. 
And uh, that's a great bill and has wonderful provision in there for stapling a green card. So that, that I think, is, is possible. The other place that I, I think we can't lose sight of is it's not enough just to do a, a, a some kind of high-skill immigration uh, liberalization. We, we really do have to get serious about producing our own talent. Uh, we, we really maybe have 10 to 15 years of the ability to tap into global markets for high-skilled people. Um, those markets are going to go away at some point. People come here because we, the delta between our opportunity and theirs is so much greater, and that delta is just going to shrink. So we've got to really start the pipeline and seriously now, and frankly, we just haven't. We, we have a lot of rhetoric about STEM education in the U.S., and it's not followed up with reality. So I'm a little hopeful that we're reauthorizing the Competes Act. Uh, I hope we're reauthorizing it. We're, it's up for reauthorization. You never know with Congress whether these things make it over the finish line. But there's a real opportunity there, I think, to put some serious provisions in on, on STEM education. One, I would just mention that we've pushed a lot and I think is a great, a great program. Uh, White House OSTP report endorsed our findings, and that's this uh, idea of STEM high schools. We have only 100 specialty math and science high schools in the country. These are great, great institutions, and for anybody who says that they're just for uh, uh, elite white uh, upper class kids, I would encourage you to go look at the Dallas Math and Science Academy. At least one study I said ha they had the highest AP test scores in the country, and it's almost 85 percent, something like that, black and Hispanic kids. Uh, so these, these are really great institutions that take kids who have a natural proclivity and interest in STEM, give them a great opportunity. They almost all of them go to college, a lot of them go to grad school. I think we've got to do something like that. Marv, did you want to add anything else about STEM from your perspective? No, I, I think he covered it well. Okay. And then the other question I have for you, Marv, is that with your, your groups, um, Engine Advocacy and the executives, what are you hearing from them about what they're most pleased with in terms of coming out, if hopefully there is something, and then their biggest complaint about policy making and, and things that are coming out of, out, of, out of either Congress or out of the White House? So um, engine advocacy, they're, they're big fans of, uh, of the JOBS Act and, uh, and crowdfunding. Uh, they, you know, I think they're encouraged by people who understand technology and want to encourage innovation. Uh, so I think, they've, I think when I speak to them, they're very encouraged by certain members they've met, certain folks in the administration they've met, uh, and, uh, and a lot of the proposed legislation they would support. Uh, you know, as, as we all know, it's hard to get something passed, uh, and so it's hard to, and last, the last Congress was the least productive Congress, so there are very few things to point to, to either dislike or to like. But the, uh, the, the core issues of, of engine advocacy, you know, what they're really interested in include patent reform. Uh, there's a sort of feeling in, in D.C. that we already did patent reform. Mm -hmm. don't, don't we have to, can't we just move on? Uh, but, but it didn't actually solve some of the core problems. And so we see the patent issues, both the, the headline-making patent issues of Apple suing Samsung uh, and the entire global patent war system over smartphones. Uh, but we also see what people call patent trolls, companies that buy up and accumulate a whole bunch of patents and then try to sue uh, lots of innovative companies. But they generally go after startups first, uh, scare them, threaten them, often companies that don't have, an, have a lawyer yet, and force them to, to take the easy deal of paying off a license. Mm -hmm. And then once there's a whole bunch of people who've paid them a license, they then go to the bigger guys and say, look, we're an industry standard. Everyone has recognized that they have to license this technology from us. And so these, these trolls, people think of them as maybe a drain on, on innovation. So patents has, has been a big issue. I think high school immigration is something that's talked about often. Uh, the, you know, protecting platforms, uh, you know, they don't talk about it in terms of net neutrality, uh, but they just talk about it in terms of having access to, um, to all users without, you know, the fear of being blocked or discriminated against, uh, or, you know, really onerous bandwidth caps. And so just the ability to make something and just make it available to everyone in the world uh, without having to cut special deals with each and every ISP. Uh, and so those are, those are some of the major ones. There are also some concern around privacy, but I tend to hear about patents and, uh, and high-skilled immigration fairly often. But what you don't hear, interestingly, is taxes. Mm -hmm. You don't hear from, from smaller companies. Mm -hmm. There are very few people who have a burning idea and want to solve a problem who are really going to be dissuaded by taxes. I think that's a sort of... Um, what people on Twitter call a first world problem, a problem that you have later. Uh, and antitrust is a problem that you hope to have as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
Um, Rob, in your book, uh, Innovation Economics, you talk about creating a better environment for technology and economic growth. Could you just tease out a little bit? I, it's a chance for you to say something about your book, but if you could share with us a little bit about what we need to do to make this environment a little bit better. You touched on it a little bit in your opening remarks, but if you could just add a little bit more to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, this, I think one of the, so I've been, I've been struck recently in reading various things, I don't know how many people read the Bob Robert Gordon piece that said, you know, woe is us, the world is over and we'll never have another bit of growth. And then Eric Bernolfsson at MIT is the robots are all gonna kill our jobs, go, so, because productivity is gonna go up 50% a year. Uh, these are interesting because they're comp only one of them can be right. But I think both are wrong, but, but they cannot both be right. Um, we're either got stagnation or rapid growth. And I think what it really fundamentally reflects is sort of this Rashomon economy where you can look at parts of the U.S. economy and go, oh, my God, we're in terrible shape. And then you look at other parts and go, wow, it's pretty good. And I think what we say in our book, the part that's in terrible shape uh, or could be in better shape is really our exports traded sector, our the companies that are out competing in global markets, uh, the ability for the U.S. to be competitive is very difficult. We have the highest, third highest effective corporate tax rate. We don't invest enough in our infrastructure and our skills and our science. So I, I, we've lost a third of our manufacturing jobs. But the part where we're really doing well, in fact, probably better than almost any other country in the world, is this sort of the, the part that Marvin talked about with the, with the lawyers and the, and, and the hairdressers and the, and the domestic part of our economy, the part that's here, it's, it's incredibly uh, effective at using information technology. You know, our companies use the internet better than any other, almost any other country in the world. So I think, um, I think having said that, what do we need to do? Um, I think we've got to do a couple of things. Number one, I think that we, un unless we have a more uh, effective corporate tax code, we're just simply not going to be competitive. And I really, I just have to say, I really reject the notion that both parties have going into the debate that corporate tax has to be revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're revenue neutral, then why bother? Because you're still going to have the same highest effective corporate tax rate that you had before. That doesn't change. So we've got to bite the bullet and look at what other countries are doing. And, you know, Sweden just lowered their corporate tax rate. Uh, you know, if they can do it, they're socialists, right? We ought to be able to do it. So I think that's number one. I think, I think number two is um, um, we've got to have a better trade policy. I mean, it's interesting, and if anybody saw the Indian announcement yesterday, we just blogged about this on our blog, Innovation Files, at ITIF.org. In, in India just announced a really new, big, sort of fiber optic broadband deployment thing for India. All right, good for them. But they had a provision in there that no company outside the Indian territory can bid or win that contract. Mm. So not even a company, as I believe, I'm sure that's right, not even a company in there has to be, they listed the Indian companies that could win that contract. And this is outrageous. I mean, this is just completely outrageous. And, and we've got to take a stand and fight that. I mean, our proposal is get rid of their, their, uh, their GSP preferences. Uh, just say, forget it. You, you want preferences to our marketplace, it means you have to have your economy. So I think we've got to do a much better job. A lot of US IT companies are under that sort of assault every day globally. We see that with cloud center, uh, cloud data center, cloud requirements and things like that. You know, on the domestic side, it's kind of the things that I think we've got to do, invest in our infrastructure, and our, uh, particularly these sort of intangibles, uh, high skills, things like that. I wanted to, um, because you, you touched on something which I was about to go to, which is the international part. The United States, of course, is not a, an island in and of itself. We exist in an international framework, and, and Marvin, you've done a lot of international work, and what I wanted to have you comment on is, one, like how are we doing as a country in terms of engaging um, in the agencies of the United States, engaging their counterparts around the world? Are we effective in representing U.S. interests, corporate interests? What, what would you say about that? Because we, we obviously see the EU, but there are other forms of government um, that are now all at play in the Internet. Yeah. So let, let, me, uh, let me focus on, on China in, in just two ways. And I think they're really hard problems. So, so without, without really passing judgment on, on what we have done, you know, when you, when, what China does is sort of two things that are interesting. One, they block a lot of our companies from being in that market of a billion people. And two, they steal our IP. Right? So, um, so you have a lot of copycat companies, and you have a lot of what seems like state-sponsored corporate espionage. Right, a, few year, a few years ago, um, the, the Office of the Counterintelligence uh, released a report calling out China specifically uh, for all of the corporate espionage. And so that is sort of hard to respond to. You know, how, how do you, it's sort of a new question in international law. 
how do, how do you respond to that kind of just rampant IP theft, which is you know, really kind of a threat to our national well-being and economic growth and perhaps security? So it's a tough question. And then the second tough question is how do you respond to the fact that you know, while they're making clones of, of Twitter, right, Weibo, uh, which is a Chinese Twitter, or Renren, Ren, which is the Chinese Facebook, while they're just making clones, you know, it's an entire uh, area that our country, you know, it's both a censorship issue and also a trade issue, and that these companies will be uh, insulated from competition, sort of incubated, uh, and then once they have you know, this billion person market that they have as their foothold, they then spread to other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I remember when, when Baidu was expanding across Asia and had a foothold in China, whereas you know, Google, Google could never really have that foothold because they couldn't compete fairly. And so I do think that you know that's a really hard challenge, or sort of two hard challenges. You know how how the how the government engaged on the ITU. I think a lot of you probably were involved in that. I think the U.S. Um, did a great job there. I think there was a, lots of great collaboration among you know government, private sector, nonprofit in a unit unified position against UN takeover UN takeover of the internet. I'm even using uh, Rob McDowell's language, uh, which is unusual for me. Uh, but, but, I, but, but there are some really hard problems where I think that you know, we need really sustained uh, attention you know, and some aggressiveness, perhaps. But, but do you think, are, are our agencies and the way our government is, are we equipped in, with the way the world is uh, operating? It's not, it's not only a China issue, but you know, comment on Europe, mm -hmm. when so much is happening there um, in, the, in the privacy areas and, and other areas. Sure. Uh, so, it's, so you know, when you look at the government, our government, you know, it's not a monolithic thing. You have lots of different agencies. You have Commerce doing something on privacy. You have the FTC doing something on privacy, uh, and then you have Europe, and that's also not a monolithic government. You have lots of different governments. Lots of, so, I'm not sure which of the government institutions around the world moves the slowest or the fastest. Um, but luckily, the, our government isn't racing against really nimble um, tech companies. Uh, it's racing against other other governments, uh, and so um, are, are, do you have something in mind? Because it seems like you're you know, trying to. It, where I'm going is is yeah. that that do you feel that we should be leading more in terms of I mean, if you just look at oh, look sure. at privacy, you know, as an issue, you know, or do we allow and kind sure. of you know lead from behind? I'm I'm sort of you know. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So so, I think we should I think we should definitely lead, uh, for for many reasons. You know, partly because. We are where the internet was born, and where a lot of the most innovative companies exist. But if you look at privacy, and you look at our moral authority to lead, and I think it requires us to think about, um, you know, the FISA amendments, the USA Patriot Act, and how that's seen around the world. Mm -hmm. It's usually treated as uh, just a national security thing, but it's also a competition issue because around the world, companies will compete with American companies, saying, "Oh well." You, know, you don't want your data stored on on Gmail servers because of the, because of the USA Patriot Act, or you know we don't want to follow their privacy um, policies even on the consumer side, hmm. and do not track etc. Because those people don't care about privacy, and we know that because of the USA Patriot Act. And so I'm not. <clears throat> I, I know I in terms of um, in terms of our moral authority that can be questioned easily because we try to set ourselves to a high standard. Uh, and I, I think we should continue trying to do that. But, but as friends of ours at the, at the State Department and other agencies recognize, you know, turning the ship of state yeah. around requires a few years and, uh, and a lot of discussion. Yeah. Rob, do you want to comment on the international? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Marvin and I probably fully agree. I just want to make sure uh, that I, I make sure we do. I, I completely agree on, the, on the, the, what part of this digital due process coalition and, and the um, the different standard the government has for data that's stored outside of your home, uh, to me, it makes absolutely no sense, and uh, and it hurts our standing legally to enforce the kinds of regimes and principles we want. So I do think we actually have to lead, and I think we have to lead a lot more. I would not say we have to lead by becoming more stringent, though. I mean, if we're leading on privacy, it's, you know, we can we can out trump the Europeans on privacy, but we can also look at their internet <coughs> economy. I, I would trade our internet economy for theirs any day of the year. Um, and one of the reasons their internet economy is not very good is because they overly regulate privacy. And they make it very hard for businesses and smart startups and to do innovative things with data. 
So that's not how we want to lead. Yep. Mm -hmm. We don't want to lead with our regulatory race to the top, but we want to lead with, I think, the vision we had in the 90s, and by the way, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to, in the Clinton administration, I just mean in the 90s, where the U.S. really was the global leader on the Internet. We, had, we, were, the, we were leading in innovation, and I think if, if the reason we're able to have moral authority on this is not just because we're the United States, but it's because we're seen as the most innovative country in the world, and countries want to learn from us about how to do that. And that's really at risk, I think. And, and, it, and that would be a place where I would, you know, if we need a national innovation policy, we need a better tax code, we need a better R&D credit, we need more science funding. You know, I did a little blog a couple weeks ago on, where I took, uh, or, took to task Peter, people like Peter Thiel who complain that you know, we don't have flying cars and all we got are 140 characters. And look, the reason we don't have flying cars is because we're $2 trillion short of government R&D over the last two decades. Uh, I'm not saying we wouldn't develop a flying car, but we, we would have gotten a lot farther down the path if we'd had $2 trillion more of R&D. <laughs> so we got to do a lot of things like that to restore our innovation leadership. And, um, and one, by the way, one little thing we need to do, and maybe it's not little if you work there, but uh, the reason we don't do more is because we don't fund our agencies, particularly USTR, we fund them at a very minimal level. Yeah. And we're asking them to do this incredibly hard job that's getting bigger and bigger every day, and we fund them at this little teeny bit. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to have a serious conversation about giving our trade enforcement uh, and trade negotiating people a bigger budget, more resources. Uh, because it's a big, big job. We're not living in the old world where they're just negotiating with Europe and you know a couple of free trade agreements at, 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 at Doha. Very good. Are there any uh, questions from the uh, from the audience? Yes. Right here. Yeah. Um, it seems like there's sort of a dichotomy between what you were mentioning in terms of the job creation where we can create these high-tech jobs and then those will sort of have, for lack of a better term, trickle-down effect to the rest of the community. And from what I've seen so far, a lot of the focus in this administration has been on all these folks have lost jobs, particularly older workers, and then they're not trained or skilled, as well as younger people, since we're not investing as well as we could be in STEM. And so I'm wondering how we can make that argument to people, and I think the trickle down makes sense, but we also have this cadre of slightly older workers who may not find their way into training, and maybe we've not been doing a good job of connecting them in the right ways. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. Marvin, you want to take a stab at that? You know, it's, it's actually not something I've, I've, thought, I've thought of much other than having thought of the problem. Um, and I, and I, I do think that, um, and I don't know if you've thought about this, Rob, in, uh, that. We could either have government investment or private investment in retraining programs, and I think they would go a long way. Yeah, I think just to be clear, the lion's share of the jobs that are created from sort of internet and IT technology are not in the industry itself. The industry does create jobs, but I think as Marvin alluded to, it's in the, the banks that are becoming internet enabled. It's the, the taxis that are being internet enabled. Uh, you know, when you go to the airlines and you check in with your mobile pass, you're, you know, some, some worker there who used to take your piece of paper and then send it somewhere to type it in, those jobs aren't, aren't there anymore. But it's not like those people are unemployed, they're doing something else. So the real key question is how do you make those transitions possible? And again, you know, this whole debate to me is a false and stale debate between job protectionism and just laissez-faire. I look at, a, we talk about this in our book, the model to us is that are the Scandinavians where they've embraced a principle called flex security. In other words, flexibility and security. You get security through flexibility. And they have very active labor market policies with support for training while you're even on the job um, so that if you lose your job, you go somewhere else. And I think we've got to embrace that as a vision and then how we get there is another question. Very good, yes. Oh. Uh, Keith Moore from Open Government TV. Uh, Robert, I'd like to ask you in particular um, on the sequestration, what do you think um, the reality for the next 120 days for internet advocacy is? You mean, is it going to happen? Well, what the impact of sequestration on internet advocacy? Okay, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what you're alluding to. We, we, we in terms of budget cuts, um, you know, you talked about the agencies actually not having enough, but sure. that's a great opportunity for technology, but. Yeah. No one is really talking about um, how those budget cuts are just going to continue to whittle away at maybe even an in inspiration to um, advance technology. 
Yeah, I mean, we did a report on sequestration earlier, early, late in the fall, and, and our estimate was um, uh, just looking at the R and D part of the sequestration. You know, you you, you would be they, the government would end up losing money on the deal, um, but they make it up in volume, so. Uh, um, they lose money because they're cutting off growth. Uh, growth, is, I think, as a number of people have alluded to, that's what we want. Um, you know, I get we we have a new report coming out soon on on the budget, uh, innovation-based budget, and I, I really get frustrated at the budget debate. You know, we're, we're nickel. If you anybody saw the Washington Post article, there's some fellowship program that is a special interest thing, and it's just you know, it's like it's smaller than a nanometer in, in terms of funding. You know, like, who cares? You know, the real issues are, as Bruce Melman said, the real issues are the big things like entitlement, the big things that we have to bite the bullet and realize we've got to have more revenues. And I think that's what we've got, that's what we should be fighting about, not, not and most of what government does, they do for a reason. I mean, we have a State Department because we got a world, you know, we, we have, uh, <laughs> you know, we have EPA, all that. so I, I think that's more what we have to focus on. <laughs> we'll have one more, uh, I think we have time for just, what, one more? Thanks. Um, speaking of big things, uh, infrastructure question. Uh, what do you see as the impact of uh, embedding ICT in traditional infrastructure on uh, the future of broadband or telecom infrastructure, the, the trillions of dollars we spend on traditional infrastructure and making those all smart and how that impacts the relatively small amount we spend on communications, broadband infrastructure? Yeah, so we have another report coming out soon on uh, what we call hybrid infrastructure, which is exactly this notion of embedding IT into traditional infrastructures. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. I mean, people call it the Internet of Things, but you know, it's it's, it's basically widely diffused IT, whether it's in whether it's in bridges or it's in our our ID card, not our ID cards, but our keys or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think that's a big, big deal. It's going to happen. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth. That's the thing. And I guess maybe Marvin and I, I was, we've had this Kumbaya fest. Uh, I maybe would take maybe one yeah. exception, um, and that's this notion of, of where we stand in in our broadband. Um, we have another report coming out in two weeks on uh, you know, this sort of analysis of U.S. ranking in broadband, and. From our analysis looking at it, the, the picture that often a lot of people paint is much more, the reality is much more nuanced than it is. Um, we actually rank fairly high in the, in the OECD in, in broadband deployment. So if you're just saying how many houses get, get broadband, we actually do pretty well where we don't rank as well as in how many people adopt it. And one of the reasons is that Ray knows quite well from the wonderful work that Ray did when he was head of um, One Economy. One economy. Uh, that's because there is a bigger share of the U.S. who simply don't have computers and digital literacy than virtually any other OECD country except Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, you know, it's hard to sell broadband to somebody when they don't have a computer and don't know how to use it. They're not going to buy it. So that's why, you know, the FCC in, in partnership with providers have been doing that. And the second reason is, we, you know, even, even with that, we have, real, we have real differences between, we have among the highest uh, loop length in the world. Uh, just because we're such a big suburban a country. Uh, you got a lot of countries like Japan that have put massive, massive tax incentives into their providers to deploy fiber networks and the like. So uh, it's, it's not to say that we're perfect. I don't, absolutely, we're, we, we, need, we always need a better network, but I don't think we're as bad as, as the sort of prevailing wisdom. I'm so excited to disagree. Uh, <laughs> so let me just disagree on that point and, and answer the question. So and we'll end on the disagreement. After. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> I was afraid this would be a love fest because I knew what he, what he would say. Uh, so I do actually think that uh, we, we actually are um, not doing super well. And the argument that uh, you know, other, we have a big suburban country doesn't really respond to the fact that our networks in New York, which is a city, aren't as good as the networks in Paris and, and Japan and in, in South Korea. And the, the leading report uh, was a few years ago by the Berkman Center, uh, comparing our country with other countries around the world. Uh, and, the, and the main reason why people don't take adopt broadband here versus elsewhere is because it's too expensive and doesn't provide enough value, whereas in other countries, you can get far more capacity for far lower prices, right? So um, if you offer someone something that's nicer and cheaper, they will adopt it more frequently under Econ 101. 
Um, so, so that's my, can we, can we my, my aggressive there. response. Got to give Rob okay. one last shot, Could, and then Alan is going to take over. But I want to answer to the Internet <laughs> of Things point. So on the Internet of Things, I actually wrote an article in Slate a few uh, weeks ago about the Internet of Things and how we're moving to a world where everything will be connected to the Internet, right? Every sensor, every device, uh, you know, our, our car will be talking to our uh, heating system as we're pulling up or whatever. And if we want to make sure we enable the Internet of Things, I think we need an open Internet, something like net neutrality or that principle and open platform so that people can make any device and attach it to the network, make any software and attach it to the network. We've, we've made some strides. I mean, Verizon's network is under an open, uh, an open access condition of sorts uh, based on an auction several years ago. Uh, AT&T negotiated the net neutrality rule. You know, we'll publicly say that. Uh, and, and so they're, they're able to live with parts of the net neutrality rule, which has some exceptions on, on, the, on the wireless side. We're going to see a very big fight on net neutrality. Uh, if the DC circuit strikes down the FCC's 2010 rule, uh, Rob alluded to it and started discussing Title II already. So I think that the Internet of Things uh, will hinge partly on okay. net neutrality. 30 Less. seconds on, on Mars. First of all, when you, when you look at different speed tiers, we actually, on certain tiers, we're actually among the cheapest in the world. Um, I'll let you read the report when it comes out. And secondly, on this New York thing, look, the reason why we don't have, why, why Paris has lower prices in New York and a better network is because they cherry pick and they allow to provide separate deals for New York. We could do that in the US. We could just say to Verizon, you get to charge 100 bucks for the people up in, outside at Poughkeepsie, and you get to charge 10 bucks for the people in New York. We don't do that as a policy. We require carriers to serve everybody more or less the same where they're doing it with, with the same level of prices. And that's why prices are balanced. They're like this. So other countries, you, you just see a lot, a lot of cherry picking. And uh, you know, free, for example, the big telecom uh, uh, CLEC in Paris, Free is not down in southern France out in the wine country because it costs a boatload of money to provide internet down there. Free is in Paris where it doesn't cost anything because they got a sewer system. So well, that's the big difference, I would argue. So as the referee, stay, stay <laughs> tuned. As Rob said, he has like five reports coming out and, and clearly uh, uh, my good friend to my right has other reports on his end and he'll continue to write and that's what makes this such an interesting uh, uh, subject. So Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Right. Well, I, this. Uh this concludes our uh, allotted time together. Uh, I would just observe, uh, well, I think from the afternoon, you know, the verdict is in, the internet matters. Um, <laughs> or at least it, uh, it certainly matters to, uh, to our, our economy. And uh, I would just say, you know, that was not an obvious statement 10 years ago, that it would matter as much as it does today. Uh, and um, uh, we certainly have a wealth of information and data and new books about, uh, and new reports about uh, how much it matters. And I think what we've heard today also is that there are clearly a set of extremely important policy debates, whether it's about uh, broadband, spectrum, immigration, tax, trade, uh, that we're going to be hearing about and that are going to make a big difference in terms of whether we're really going to achieve the promise that we all believe the Internet offers. Uh, and I was also gratified to hear this conversation that was raised in this question about some of the dislocations because we know there's, to borrow a phrase from one of my colleagues at MIT, that there's a, a difference between the bounty and the spread, that there is going to be, uh, I think we have a lot of faith that the Internet can uh, and IT can do a lot to promote productivity in our economy as a whole. The question is going to be uh, how we deal with the fact that that may be unevenly distributed. So we have some big issues to discuss. Um, as I say, this concludes uh, our program. But uh, I've been asked to mention at least that uh, the hope is that this will be a continuing conversation. And in the spirit of continuing the conversation, uh, I was asked to mention that there is a bar uh, and a coffee <laughs> shop just across the lobby. And we hope, uh, hope to see folks over there. Please, uh, on behalf of the, uh, of the uh, Internet Caucus Advisory uh, Commission Board and, uh, and, uh, and staff, I'd just like to say uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists uh, today here, Ray and Rob. Uh, Marvin and all the panelists today for a terrific program. And thank you for coming. To you.